Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Casual Criminalist. As always, I'm your host, Simon. Welcome. <coughs> Sorry, just warming up. It's first thing. I was going to say it's first thing on a Monday, but it's not. I just got back from a little vacation. It's first thing on a Wednesday. I haven't recorded anything in ages. Ah! I'm sorry. I will battle through. I have coffee right here, which I know is not brilliant for the old voice, but uh, yeah, I need it. I need it. It's uh, it's my life force. So this is another episode. This is Peter Curtin, the vampire of Dusseldorf. Thank you to Matt who wrote this episode. If you're new here, welcome. Welcome to the Casual Criminalist. The format is I've never read this script before. We're going to explore it together. I say it's a mid-length piece, 14 pages. Not sure what that will work out to. But uh, yeah, that's not important. Why, why? You don't need these details. Let's just get into it. Monsters. It's a concept we're all familiar with, both through real life and make-believe. When we're little, we're frightened of the boogeyman under the bed, and as we grow older, we learn of all different types of monsters created through the ages to scare and even entertain. Yeah, my kid's going through. I've got a... Uh, she's almost three now. She'll be three in November. Maybe she's three when this episode comes out. Who knows? But, right, she's not afraid of monsters right now, but she has these nightmares and she wakes up and she just says, no, bubbles, no, <laughs> no bubbles. And we don't have a, like, I'm immediately thinking it's like a pet called bubbles, but it's not. She just has, you know, she blows those bubbles, you know, from one of those little bubble maker things. And uh, yeah, apparently she has nightmares about those. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> like many nights. Bubbles, no, no bubbles. <laughs> oh. I wake her up and I tell her it's a nightmare, and then she goes back to sleep. That's a good dad move. Then, as we grow even older, we see the horrors of the real world. We learn that sometimes it's the acts of a single person that can leave a true lasting mark on the lives of so many. Murderers, rapists, violent robbers, kidnappers, arsonists. These are the monsters of our daily lives. I, I get it. I get, I get, you know, murderers, rapists, violent robbers, kidnappers. I mean, arsonists. Sure. Is that, do they really belong in that same category? Because if someone's a kidnapper, I think they're a much worse person than an arson. I guess if there's someone inside the building and they're setting it on fire, then that's just murderer. But someone who sets shit on fire, it's like, I don't think that person falls into the category of murderer, rapist, violent robber, or kidnapper. Do they? <laughs> is, that, is that just me? A bit like, if someone kidnapped my family, I'll be a lot more upset than if they burned down my house. Isn't that reasonable? I mean, I'm sure I'm definitely going to have nightmares after that about people burning down my house, but it's not as bad as someone kidnapping or murdering your family, right? Anyway, <laughs> let's move on from that cheery topic. I don't know. These are the monsters that stalk the real world every day, right under our noses. Today, we meet a monster who covers both categories and everything in between as we step once more into the darkness to tell our tale of misery. I must warn you now, Simon, as well as all of our dear viewers, the subject of today's video is perhaps one of the most demented, sadistic, monstrous, depraved, and literally bloodthirsty individuals we have ever covered on the show. And and honestly, Matt, there is a lot of competition for that, because uh, this show has covered the uh, famous bellend, infamous bellend, Pedro Lopez, who I desperately try to forget, but I cannot, because it's horrible. If you haven't seen that episode, don't watch it just don't and i know now people will be like oh well i'm gonna watch it because simon told me not to like the other day i said don't look up crocodile drink drug on uh google images don't do it but of course people do because it's like don't think of an elephant but uh really don't look at that episode don't don't look up pedro lopez you don't want to i promise you before the vile rampages of lopez and shipman before the infamous horror of the big four that were bundy dharma ridgeway and gacy this psychotic brute was perhaps the most sinister serial killer since jack the ripper this is a man who preyed on the innocent women of germany for his own sick and twisted sexual satisfaction leaving a trail of blood a mile long in his wake a true monster of the real world with the name bestowed on him worthy of the tales of our childhood nightmares this is the story of peter curtin the vampire of dusseldorf a world full of miseries and woes and troubles let us set the stage for the carnage to come peter curtin was born on may the 26th 1883 in mulheim cologne in germany at the time known as mulheim mulheim am rhein i'm sorry i'm not going to look up all these german places because it interrupts my flow and uh, also, I don't want to. <laughs> so, apologies. He was the oldest of 13 children, though at least two of them passed away while they were still young. When was this? Yeah, 1880s. 
Yeah, yeah, this was back in the day where it was like you just had multiple children because some are gonna die. <laughs> so, oh, Jesus. Apparently people didn't even like get used to, uh, you know, they didn't want to get too close to their children before they were like two or three years old because they didn't want to get too attached because they'd probably like pop off. And I'm like, that's super intense. Like my kids are in that like younger than that age. One of them's just about to pass the boundary of like reasonable chance of survival, like back in the day. Now it's like if someone's kid dies, it's a travesty. Whereas back in the day, it was just like, yeah, you know, we didn't even give little, you know, we didn't even give number three a name yet. <laughs> we don't give him a name until he's three. God, does it suck. And they lived with their parents in a tiny single room apartment. Oh my God, that is a lot of people in a single room. I'm like, <laughs> I live in a fairly large apartment with my family. There's me and my wife and our two kids who are very young. And uh, I mean, I, Americans who are the majority of the show. Everything's big. But like, my, I don't know, my apartment's what? It's like 130 square meters. So what is that like? 1400 square feet 1300 square feet something like that and i'm still like there's like four of us in there and I'm like, it's too small <laughs> it's like the biggest first world problem ever and it's like back in the day there'd be at least 700 children in there as seems typical for most serial killers curtin's father was an absolute and utter bag the man was a raging alcoholic and was prone to beat curtin and his siblings oh, whenever they felt they whenever he felt they stepped out of line on more than one occasion his father who smashed off his skull Oh, while smashed off his skull. Sorry, I thought there was some literal skull smashing off there. That'd be a very different scene. Would order his wife and all of his children to assemble in front of him while forcing his wife to strip in front of their children. Then, whether his wife was 100% willing or not, he'd start having sexual intercourse with her right in front of the kids without any concern for how something like that, like that might affect them mentally going forward. Father of the year, am I right? Oh my god, what are you up to, you f***ing sicko? And I need, this is like casual criminal's rule number two. After rule number one, don't write down your crimes. I'm not sure if it is actually rule number two. There's like an official canon of rules. But um, it should be don't f*** up your kids like this. Don't do it. It's weird. Being the oldest, Peter was the most frequently targeted of the children for his father's cruelty, so much so that he would refuse to come home from school and ran away on multiple occasions. He had wandered the streets for days, even weeks, all while becoming accustomed to the darker side of human life. Spending much of his time with outcasts and petty criminals, he was very quickly introduced to, the life of, to a life of crime early on, all in the name of feeding and clothing himself while on the streets. It was while on the streets that Curtin made the acquaintance of a local dog catcher who lived in the same building as his family. Oh, I just realized that he's the kid. Oh, it's... Give me a break. Everyone at home is following along, and somehow I'm the man reading this, and I'm like, yeah, you know, it's the father who's the who's the bad person. It's like, no, no, no. He just ruins this kid enough so that he grows up to become some sort of murderous vampire. So yeah, always remember rule number two the two became close and the dog catcher would begin letting peter join him on his rounds about town looking for any strays wandering the street curtin seemed to have all the rotten luck when it came to older male role models as while spending time with this man he was shown up acts of utter cruelty he was taught how to torture and even kill many of the dogs they had captured um i think there's a big difference here this is like 1880 uh, the stray dogs and of course there's people who are going to go around as a job and capture and kill these stray dogs um I, that even just that happens today right I can't believe I don't know this, but like there's stray dogs and there's not homes for all those stray dogs and there's not some sort of big magical place where all of the stray dogs go. They put those dogs down, don't they? Which is all kinds of depressing. Um, and I'm not, <laughs> people would be like, I mentioned before, like I'm not the biggest dog fan. I'm not a crazy like dog fan like so many people are, but obviously I'm not all for like killing dogs. Jesus. Um, <laughs> I made a statement which turned out to be incredibly controversial on uh, another channel i do that i said i've committed dog genocide before i killed a single person and i'm like and people are like how can you value the life of people above the lives of dogs and i still stand by that because yeah people are pieces of shit, but most people aren't oh my god I, and now i'm gonna get cancelled on this show as well for that and this show is much more popular so it's so. he's just a dog jen just a dog yeah. just i don't know i just want to be honest about it though i just i think you know oh god i'm just gonna stop i'm digging myself a huge hole huge hole huge hole <laughs> this is the biggest hole i've dug on this channel and we've dug some holes the golden rule is if you've got yourself in a hole stop digging yeah but what i'm trying to say uh sorry to get back to the point is that yeah like capturing and killing dogs back in the day or whatever that can be seen as a profession that unfortunately that has to happen apparently but torturing the dogs what why that would be like, yeah, no, we have to execute this man. Let's torture him first. That's the sort of crazy 
that goes down in like serial killers basements and i don't know iran or some like that like let's not be doing that let's not be torturing things before we kill them it's just weird and unnecessary it's not okay it sucks it does he also he was taught how to torture and even kill the dogs they captured the older man even going so far as to show young peter how to properly perform bestiality on the poor defenseless animals matt what are you writing properly perform bestiality there is no proper way to perform bestiality matt <laughs> bestiality is not something that should be performed anyway at all it's definitely illegal and f***ing weird all this evil <laughs> don't kink shame simon no in this case we're cool with that all this evil everything he had been forced to experience and endure it had already started to take its toll on curtain and eventually this little man simply accepted that the world he lived in was a cruel one one where the strong survive one where you take what you want and one where life is a fragile thing one he could manipulate he soon put that to the test, and the test was successful. When he was only nine years old, Peter Curtin claimed his first two souls. When he was nine. He's got some serious Mary Blandy going on right now, which is another horrible episode that you don't want to listen to. While out on a raft with a pair of other children, Peter suddenly forced the head of one of the boys under the water and held it there. The boy struggled for his life under the water while the other boy leapt into the water to try and help his friend, only to meet the same fate. The police were called, they investigated, and they deemed the whole ordeal an accident. And in this case, I totally don't blame the police, because there is no witnesses. And what happens in this Curtin Bellend, Curtin Bellend would be like, yeah, no, it was an accident, they fell overboard and drowned and there's no other there's no evidence to the contrary they just drowned and he's nine the police are going to be like you psycho murderer they're going to be like oh my god i can't believe he went through that that poor kid no man knows till he experiences it Eventually, Curtin's father was arrested and jailed in 1897 after raping Peter's 13-year-old sister Jesus. While he was behind bars, his mother got a formal separation order, soon remarrying and moving the whole family to Dusseldorf. Now with his father out of the picture, you'd think that perhaps there'd be room for Curtin to grow properly as a person, right? Well, no. Sadly, the putrid apple doesn't fall far from the rotting tree. Taking cue from his horrible father, Peter soon began raping his sister, the same one his father had raped prior, all under his mother's nose. No Rule number two! Rule number two! Peter's also this guy's a psycho Peter's sexual nature continued to twist and distort him as he grew older and older eventually he began a relationship with a girl in school the same age this might have had the chance to be good for him the first real relationship with a woman in his life but sadly it only sent him spiraling further into the darkness while the young lady allowed Peter to undress and fondle her every time he attempted anything explicitly sexual she denied him outright being a pent-up teenage boy with sexual urges is something most of us can understand and sympathize with yes of course <laughs> but we're not gonna do whatever the f this guy does next however i don't believe would go to the lengths curtain did in order to find his sweet release sneaking into the nearby stables oh <sighs> Oh, the young degenerate would end up satisfying himself with sheep, goats, and pigs. Ah, oh, dude! It's here that the monster would escalate yet again, and in doing so would unlock what would be his main source of pleasure for the remainder of his life. What the f***, dude? While doing the thing with the unfortunate livestock, Curtin pulled out a knife and drove it directly into the jugular of the poor creature. Oh my f lord. I have no words. This is beyond f***. Up. Blood sprayed and dripped out of the open wound as the defenseless creature cried out in pain at the sight of the crimson essence pouring out of the animal and its life fading away with every pump of its heart. Curtin felt a rush of pleasure and elation that he'd never felt before, achieving orgasm. Oh, dude, what? I, I just said it already, but again, I must reiterate this is someone needs to get this guy and put him into one of those padded rooms with the glass mirror so people can just watch him all the time and make sure like whatever drug there were no this is like the 1880s we need to put him on like i don't know whatever powerful drugs they make to just turn him into some sort of zombie jesus what the f Hematolagnia. That, that sounds about right. Hematolagnia is a sexual fetish where one gets aroused and achieves climax by the sight of blood well, fortunately, it's not a word that I'm going to have to use very often, or hopefully ever again. Although I am doing a true crime podcast, so let's uh, let's learn that word. <laughs> 
This can be heightened by the act of licking or drinking said blood, but usually the simple sight of it will do. If you felt dirty reading that, believe me when I say I felt even dirty having to look up the information, let alone writing it. I know it's not cool to kink shame, but I think we'll have to give a pass on this one. Yes, yes, definitely. <laughs> it was what I brought up before and I was making fun of it. And people had to go at me being like, that, that Simon, you, you shouldn't kink shame like that. And then I was like, okay, I get it. And now I'm sort of super sensitive towards it because you don't want to get cancelled. And but no, there's clearly a line. There's clearly a line. <laughs> this crosses that line. So blood. No. Although I mean, as long as it's not. Uh, uh, <laughs> let's not dig holes. Some not into it. <laughs> the revelation only furthered Curtin's descent into depravity. He would more frequently visit the stables, each time viciously raping the animals, all while plunging his knife into their bodies again and again with increasing ferocity. The more blood was spilt, the more powerful the release he felt, and the extreme violence more than likely aided in the amplification of his twisted pleasure. Curtin left school in 1897 at the age of 14, and two years later, in 1899, he ran away from home and relocated to the city of Koblenz after stealing all the money you could find at his household, as well as about 300 marks from his employer at the time. It was there that he began a relationship with a prostitute two years his senior, one who he would later state was up for every sexual perversion that his dark imagination could conjure. It didn't last long, though, as he was arrested a month later and charged with breaking and entering as well as theft. Sentenced to a month in jail, he was released in August of that same year. As hopefully, from that point on, we kept a really close eye on him, except no, we didn't, because this first script has like 11 more pages. It was during the year of 1899 that Peter Curtin attempted his first kill as an adult. He claimed, while speaking to the police years later, that he picked up an 18-year-old girl and persuaded her to accompany him to the Hofgarten. Before anyone asked, the Hofgarten is a well-known public park in Dusseldorf. If Curtin is to be believed, he and the girl had sex in the park, and after finishing, he strangled her until she passed out and he left her laying there believing that he had killed her please tell me that the police are like is that that same guy we arrested for theft he attempted murder let's lock him up forever in a padded room and put him on all the drugs this claim is dubious at best as there was no report of a murder or assault during that time so it's more than likely that if his story is true the girl survived and simply decided not to report the attack yes unfortunately this was like the 1890s or whatever and having sex in the park is uh, probably enough is shameful enough not to go and report that to the police even though he strangled you to what he thought was death afterwards ah oh, the past it was the worst that's true that is true regardless peter claimed that it was with this single act that his belief was set in stone in his mind that to achieve the greatest pleasure on earth he had to hurt people more than that he had to kill people it sounds like this guy is those you know when like someone's i heard this about people being into feet that there's a specific like there's two parts of the brain that like like pleasure centers or whatever that like one is sexual and one is like feet or whatever and they're close to each other so apparently like that sometimes gets this sounds like such nonsense <laughs> and i can't remember where i read it but apparently the wires can get crossed sometimes and that's why that happens this guy has more wires crossed he has some mega mega wires crossed his brain is all sorts of scrambled we've all become god's madmen all of us it didn't take long for Curtin to once again end up behind bars. The next year, in 1900, he would be arrested for fraud not once, but twice. The theft had perpetrated against his family and his employer the year prior, along with the attempted murder of a young woman with a firearm, were added to his charges, and he was convicted of all of it, spending four years in prison in Derendorf, a borough of Dusseldorf. By the summer of 1900, is it Dusseldorf or Dusseldorf? Have I been for it? Is one like the American pronunciation? Dusseldorf. Dusseldorf. Doesn't matter. Let's move on. By the summer of 1904, Curtin was a free man once more, but he didn't remain so for long. Almost as soon as he was set free, he was drafted into the Imperial German Army. Now, I'm not saying that prison is better than the army, but given the time period, what is this? Uh, what is going on in Germany? Beginning of the 19th, uh, 20th century? We're 10 years away from the First World War. Oh, God, what was Germany involved in? Aye. But given the time period and the fact that this was Germany, I doubt it was a cakewalk by any means. Apparently, Peter didn't think so either, as he was deployed to the city of Metz in Lorraine to serve in the 98th Infantry Regiment. He promptly deserted. It's now that we come to what would be the final mark on our serial killer checklist. Uh, does it? Has he? Is he a serial killer yet? He killed those two boys when he was a kid, and he attempted murder. Um... 
I think he still has to serial kill for him to be a serial killer. In the autumn of that year, Curtin started lighting fires, acts of arson, much like the killing of animals and prior trauma at the hands of awful parents, are very much in character for most serial killers as it gives them a sense of power, the power to kill and destroy at the monster's fingertips, the power to hurt and to burn anyone and anything in their path. Setting barns and haylofts ablaze, Curtin would look on from a distance, an evil smile plastered on his face as he watched his handiwork consume all in its path, chuckling as emergency services did their best to extinguish the inferno. In his later confessions to the police, he confessed to a set a total of 24 fires after he deserted the military before he was caught on New Year's Eve. Smiling the whole time, he confessed to doing so in order to gain sexual arousal at the thought of perhaps having burnt a few homeless people in the ashes. Ah, oh, you f***ers, I go. Some Patrick Bateman f right there. Because of his did not the burn in the like, murdering of homeless people. Although, wasn't that all in his mind? Anyway, because of his desertion, Curtin was tried in military court. He was convicted of desertion. In addition to multiple counts of arson, robbery, and attempted robbery, he served a sentence between 1905 and 1913. What is that? Five to eight years? That's a good sentence. That's pretty solid. Nice job, Germany. In the independent city of Munster, where he spent most of his time in solitary confinement due to multiple issues. Incidents of insubordination. What a surprise. <laughs> the guy who deserted the army. Uh, was insubordinate in prison and doesn't like authority. Shocking. It was during this long stint in prison that everything fully came together for this abomination against mankind. Far behind bars, stuck in solitary, curtains rage against the society and humanity as a whole increased, as did his need for destruction and bloodshed. Being in military prison, he was exposed to extreme forms of disciplinary punishment, and with this new revelation, everything gelled together in one horrifically macabre package. The erotic fantasies he'd created for himself while assaulting women and molesting animals mixed with the need to see the spraying scarlet viscera at the edge of his knife expanded into the want and need to stalk poor unfortunate souls in the dark streets like a predator ready to pounce. Oh, what surprising news. Prison made him worse. The deaths of the masses, their screams in his ears, and their blood seeping through his fingers, they became the ever forefront thoughts in his mind from that moment on, at times causing him to spontaneously ejaculate simply from lingering on these demented and perverted fantasies for too long. Dude. Peter Curtin was released from prison in 1913, and from there he moved to Mulham am Rhein. His crimes to this point have been horrible and damning, but if only the army had known the atrocities that were to come, they might have never let him go. Oh boy, Matt. If they had known the atrocities to come, they would have never let him go. And if they knew, and if they were, if they were like, well, we can't keep him in prison for crimes that he hasn't committed yet, um, then I would hope that some guard or some other prisoner would be like, hey, 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 let's go take a shower and bring our shanks. <laughs> Arrgh, cha -cha -cha. <laughs> My bloodlust is strong for this one. Not his type of bloodlust. I just want him to die so he doesn't commit horrible crimes. <laughs> just to make that absolutely clear didn't need to do that. For now, Peter Curtin was free, and he was ready to act on every last one of his deranged fantasies, bringing about a coup de grace on his life of crime in the most insane and blood-drenched way possible. Night had fallen over Germany, and the vampire was on the hunt. The blood is life, and it shall be mine. Curtin was back on the streets once more, and it didn't take long for him to get back to his old ways. Why, when someone is released from prison, they do watch you, right? I just know this from movies. But you go to, like, a halfway house with some other prisoners, and they keep tracking you, and then you've got that parole officer who's, like, checking on you after you've been released and shit and make sure that you're not up to some horrible shit. Aren't they doing that? They're keeping an eye on you, because they should be. They should be. One thing, I think, like, I don't know, get released from police, p police prison early and wear like a gps tracker or something i know this is the past so we're obviously talking about the present now but there's all sorts can't we start using technology more thoroughly like for this sort of stuff i don't know it's just got thoughts on that while it's clear that one of the main purposes for prison is rehabilitation <laughs> 
<laughs> That's debatable. Sometimes there's just no changing a monster. On May the 50, 25th, 1913, Curtin broke into a tavern in his neighborhood late at night in order to burgle the place. While prowling the residence, he made his way to the inn portion of the establishment where the owners lived, and he came across little Christine Klein, the nine-year-old daughter of the tavern inn owner, asleep in her bed. Face to sleeping face with the young girl, all those devilish fantasies bubbled up to the surface of his mind. Barn animals and prostitutes weren't enough, he needed more. Without further hesitation, Peter Curtin pounced on the sleeping child, wrapping his hands around her throat and strangling her. As soon as she was unconscious, he pulled out a pocket knife from his pants, and without remorse or questioning, he sliced her throat open in two swift strikes. Blood splattered over his hand and dripped into the floor, causing this depraved beast to climax instantly. What the f***, dude? It's a kid. It's a f kid. To quote, her head was facing the window. I seized it with my left hand and struggled for a minute and a half. Um, yeah, all hard pass. We're not going to read that, Matt. Let's just move on. A young life snuffed out, an innocent soul stolen, and sadly, she was only the first. Yeah, sometimes I feel like with the extended quotes from the perpetrators of these crimes, it's just, I don't want to give these faces a voice. This show, as I always say, is not about them. It's about the crimes. I mean, of course, it's about them. That sounds stupid to say it's otherwise they're in the title of the episode like <laughs> don't get too high and mighty simon um but i do want it to be more about the victims and i don't and i want it to be about the crimes and i want it to not be about extended quotes from horrible people the next day curtain because all these guys are narcissists and they like the idea that their quotes are getting read and they probably don't like the idea of me all over them I mean, the great news is they're all that this guy's, you know, long dead. Pretty much everyone we cover on this channel is either dead or in prison, except for that f Pedro Lopez who somehow escaped, which is insane. F that guy. The next day, Curtin Racine returned to the scene of the crime. Now, before you blow a gasket, Simon, it wasn't to the tavern itself, but to one across the way. He sat a smile on his face as he overheard the distraught and disgusted comments of the patrons around him. The news of the death of little Christine had gotten out and outrage was palpable, all to the delight of the vampire. The cherry on top, Christine Klein's uncle had recently gotten into a pretty heated argument with her father, and now with her dead, he became the number one murder suspect. Um, look, I've got into pretty heated arguments in my life. What I've not done afterwards is murder their f***ing child, because that is f***ing psycho. Why would you assume... That is, in, that is an insane assumption. Eventually, the poor man was cleared of suspicion, but to see him squirm put a huge grin on the face of the actual killer, a true sociopath, finding amusement in the suffering and misery of others. Two months later, the vampire struck again, another break in another burglary attempt, and Peter Curtin came across his next victim. Sound asleep in a bed was 17-year-old Gertrude Franklin, and the monster wasted no time. Leaping upon the bed, he wrapped his hands around her throat as her eyes shot open, and he throttled her savagely as she slipped into unconsciousness. Blood began to spurt from her mouth as the force of his grip, causing Christine, causing Curtin to finish once again. His business finished. He actually left poor Gertrude alive, escaping much like the first time, totally undetected. No one but a woman can help a man. Mere days after the near miss on Gertrude Franklin's life and with all the intent in the world to continue painting the town red, Curtin was once more arrested. No, not for the killing of a young girl and the brutal assault of another. He wasn't even close to the suspect on the to being on the suspect list at this point. No, this time it was for arson and burglary once again. And once again, he was found guilty. Sentenced to six years behind bars and imprisoned in a military prison in the town of Bragg, his constant instances of subordination landed him an additional two years to his sentence. Released from prison in April of 1921, the walking pile of waste moved in with his sister in the city of Altenburg. If I was this guy's f***ing relatives, and knowing the that he got up to when we were kids, like, I assume this is not the sister he raped, but they surely she's gonna know be like no no mate absolutely not you're not getting out of prison for violent crimes and coming to live with me you psycho we are not family you don't have to like all of this like the blood is thicker than water and all that shit yo when your blood relative is a psycho killer you don't have to be nice to them there's plenty of like i don't know i don't like <laughs> I don't think just because you're related to someone that you have to be there for them. I think you should be um, as a default rule. But if they are a piece of or even if they're not, even if you just don't like them very much, 
I don't think there's any real obligation there. Obviously, parent to child is totally different. But like other relationships, like brother and sister, I don't, I, I don't know. I'm not like, I don't think that's that. It's not that much of a they must help each other relationship. It was during his time here and with his sister's assistance that Peter struck up a romance with one August Scharf, a shop proprietor and former sex worker three years his senior. I realized he used the word prostitute earlier. Ah, oh, we're not supposed to use that word. It's sex worker, apparently. And then someone emailed me saying, like, you can't use sex worker. I'm like, what the f sake? I don't. I try. What am I, suppo what, what am I supposed to use? Someone was like, you should use prostitute. And I'm like, oh, for f sake it's very difficult i ignored that because it was just one person and more people have said that you, sex work is the correct one to use let me know in the comments i'm happy to learn i'm trying darkness of sound like an old man stuck in my ways it's just like things change regularly darkness must attract darkness because august didn't have the most squeaky clean record either not so much for her history as a sex worker but because she'd previously been convicted and president and imprisoned for gunning down her fiance a match truly made in the deepest depths of hades posing i don't know like if she gunned down her fiance she probably had a good reason like i'm always like willing to cut women in the past a bit of slack it's like why did she poison husbands because she could have get a divorce because that's what society said and he beat and raped her and that's just not recorded because it's the past so i'm like i'm willing to give her a little bit of a break on this one we don't know if that's the case maybe she was just a psycho murderer but i don't know it's probably more to that story isn't there posing as an ex-prisoner of war curtain swept this woman off her feet the mat two marrying only two years later it's to be noted that while the two did engage in sexual intercourse curtain was only able to get it up and actually perform by fantasizing about brutally slaughtering another woman all the while hell the pathetic sod wouldn't even attempt to consummate their marriage on the wedding night until she actually invited him to bed in 1925 curtain and his bride relocated back to dusseldorf the marriage was clearly not a happy one up to that point but as soon as they got themselves settled curtain almost immediately started an affair with not one but two different women the servant girl tieda and the housemaid mech curtain even managed to work in partial strangulation whenever he took either of them to bed august eventually found out about the affairs and was not pleased to say the least she wasn't mad at the two mistresses though blaming everything on her husband and it was on her suggestion that both teed and mech instantly dropped curtain like a bad habit and reported him to the police Tida reported that he seduced her while mech cried full-blown rape for some reason the rape charge was dropped but the seduction charge was carried out along with one for threatening behavior oh seduction used to be a crime holy sh Curtin being slapped with an eight-month sentence for his trouble. How can he? He's been like in prison so many times. Can't we do that American thing? What do the Americans do? Where it's like, oh yeah, like the three strikes. I know it's insane. I know it's insane. But for this guy, we need this shit, right? It's like, yeah, 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 bro. You can't commit arson, 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 get accused of rape, then seduction, and not go to prison forever. Everyone knows you're a piece. Of shit. Everyone knows you're gonna commit, continue committing crimes. Let's get that three strike going. Come on. He was released after just six months under the condition that he leave Dusseldorf, but he somehow managed to appeal that decision. Why is anyone listening to this prick at this point? Be like, bro, no, you leave Dusseldorf, you go back to prison. Can't we just send you to Alaska or something? Or Siberia, not Alaska. <laughs> that means Siberia. Like, the middle of nowhere. Let's just send him out. Did we have gulags yet? Let's get him in a gulag, come on. I know it's Germany and that's Russia, but let's go, come on. Ah. Oh. The children of the night, what music they make. Almost as soon as he was released from prison, the vampire of Dusseldorf struck once more. Hold on to your butts, everyone. This is going to be long and it's going to be bad. On February, dude, he already murdered a nine-year-old in our home. How much worse is it going to get? Now, I'm a little bit afraid. Did I have to start with this, like, first thing back from my f***ing holiday? And I was having such a relaxing time. I was out in the countryside, having some nice barbecues. It rained a lot, but I didn't care. It's been so hot lately. It's like mid-30s, late-30s, which I don't know what it is in Fahrenheit. It's hot. And it was so nice. I was like, oh, yes. And I come back and I read about nine-year-olds getting murdered. Straight into it, Whistle. Good job. On February the 3rd, 1929, an elderly woman by the name of Apollonia Kuhn was walking the streets of Dusseldorf, unaware that she was being watched from the shadows. As soon as she was partially obscured by the bushes, a figure suddenly leapt at the old woman, grabbing her violently by the coat. Average height, with a round face, complete with double chin, neatly combed dark hair, and a rather distinctive 
blood-stained moustache. He looks like the unholy offspring of Adolf Hitler and Pumpkinhead. No row! Don't scream! Curtin cried. Drag her into the undergrowth, the monster proceeded to stab the helpless woman a total of 24 times with a sharpened pair of scissors, injuring her horribly, but she was able to survive. 1929, and she's surviving 24. We had antibiotics then, so that's at least good. 24, 24, good lord. Five days, and that is, I think getting stabbed with a pair, sharpened pair of scissors 24 times is worse than getting stabbed with a knife 24 times, because it's that's like kind of getting, I mean, it's not a blunt object, but it's not as sharp as a knife which would be i feel like give a cleaner wound somehow why are we debating this <laughs> we don't need to let's just move on i don't need these thoughts in my mind the same couldn't be said for his next victim five days later on february the 8th curtain strangled nine-year-old rosa oliger until she lost consciousness he then proceeded to absolutely annihilate the poor girl stabbing her multiple times with the same pair of scissors in the stomach temple genitals and the heart killing the poor child as if he wasn't depraved enough, this ghoul of a man then took his fe fiendish finish. Oh my god. Okay, so let's just say that he commits a pretty horrible act of sexual assault on there, which I've read. And um, let's just say Matt says, I feel dirty beyond words just typing that. If you want to pause the video and look that up, you can. But let's just say it's a really, really horrible act of sexual assault and necrophilia i suppose sort of <laughs> don't 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 dig too far into this dear listener he then did his best to hide the body dragging her into the hedge before returning later on with a kerosene canister setting the body ablaze as he once more climaxed to the putrid burning smell what was left of her was found several days later um okay five more days passed before the vampire attacked once more this one was different from his prior victims for the simple fact that this victim was a man namely a 45 year old mechanic rudolf Scheer. curtin stabbed him 20 times in the head back and eyes killing him his body was discovered several days later to which curtin returned to the scene to observe the investigation the police none the wiser between march and july of 1929 curtin attempted to strangle a total of four women though none of them actually died during said attacks his next murder occurred on august the 11th this was maria hahn an attractive looking young lady who curtin had met only three days beforehand gaining her interest this horrid hobgoblin suggested taking her out on a date to the neanderthal valley that sunday which maria agreed to luring her into the meadow that day curtain proceeded to strangle the young woman as she pleaded for her life he ignored her of course continued to throttle her as she begged and screamed stabbed her multiple times in the head and chest it took poor maria up to an hour to die undoubtedly filled with fear and pain the whole way through he would later return to the body to burn it intending to crucify the remains to a tree to disgust and disturb the general public but her body proved to be too heavy so he simply laid underneath her burnt and decomposing body gently caressing it feeling it and as he put it he was filled with satisfaction dude your brain is so f scrambled i want to say like and i know it's often used as like an excuse or whatever but this guy he, i don't think he needs to go to prison he needs to go to like he needs to be locked in a mental institution and the key needs to be thrown the f away because this guy is not right like this isn't you know i think he's just off his rocker three months are just his brain is scrambled three months after the murder of han the vampire wrote to the police he anonymously confessed to the killing of poor maria told them her body was buried in a field as well as supplying them with a detailed map to the body very jack the ripper-esque if you ask me after that curtain kicked it up a notch on the in the early morning of august the 21st alone curtain attacked and stabbed three separate people an 18 year old girl a 30 year old man and a 37 year old woman each time he used a knife each victim was severely wounded and each victim said the same thing the attacker simply walked up to them and began stabbing them not uttering a single word it was totally random making it ever more terrifying how have you not caught this guy yet these cry i know it's the past so we don't have the kind of like great technology and all that stuff yet but jesus come on three days later on august the 24th foster sisters louise lenzen and gertrude hafmacher ages 14 and 5 respectively were walking together at a fairground in the suburb of flap when they were approached by curtain he offered louise 20 fennig if she would run and grab him a pack of cigarettes promising to look after her sister as she did so louise did what the f are you doing do not leave your five-year-old sister alone with anyone even if they're unless they're a police officer and you've checked their id do not leave 
I feel like this was the advice I was given as a kid. But even now, I'd be like, no, people could fake IDs. Don't leave your like. If I if my kids were out and they left the younger kid with a random stranger and everything turned out fine and they were just a nice random person, I would be absolutely f- livid. I would be beyond angry. And they'd be like, but I don't understand. Everything was okay. And it's like, yes, this time, 99% of times, it's going to be fine. But the one time it isn't, I'd be so pissed. (laughs) Well, you know what happened next. As soon as he was given the chance, Curtin lifted the five-year-old up by the throat, strangling her viciously as she fainted before slicing open her throat and discarding her body in a bush. As soon as Louise returned, Curtin attacked her. She attempted to escape, but it was no use. Curtin strangled her, stabbed her in the torso, one puncture, cutting her aorta. He then lived up to his nickname, biting into her throat and sucking the blood from the open wound. Mental hospital. Mental hospital. Throw away the key. A day later, he approached Gertrude Schultz, a 27-year-old housemaid, demanding sex from her. Obviously, she turned him down flat, to which the depraved beast shouted, Well, die then! He proceeded to stab her in the head, neck, shoulder, and back. She survived, but... Whether it be from the shock of it all or the blood loss she suffered, she wasn't able to provide a substantial description to the police. Two more attempted murders occurred in September before the vampire ditched his trusty knife in favor of a hammer. In the evening hours of September the 31st... Um... uh, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August... No. (laughs) No. I really doubted myself then. It can't be September the 31st, Matt. What are you talking about? That day doesn't exist, Matt. It's either got to be the 1st of October or the 30th of September. What are you smoking? Okay. <laughs> it's one of those things where it's like, uh-oh, <laughs> research. I'm sure it's just a typo. Curtin attacked 31-year-old serving girl Ida Router after luring her to a cafe, taking a walk through the local Hofgarden close to the Rhine River on this fictional day in Germany. <laughs> September the 31st. He struck her viciously in the skull with a hammer, raped her, then hit her over and over again, killing the girl. Eleven days later, on October the 11th, that's a real date. Eleven days later, so I guess it was October the 1st this happens. Or September the 30th. Oh god, how would that be? October the 11th. I guess it could be both, depending on how you want to phrase it. No, it'd be October the 1st, wouldn't it? Eleven days later, October the 1st, 2nd... Oh, I'm so confused. Let's just leave it alone. Yes, please. Carter proceeded to do the same thing to another servant girl, this time 22-year-old Elizabeth, Dor- Elizabeth Doria. Luring her to a cafe before taking her for a walk along the Klein Dussel River, he attacked her with his hammer, striking her hard in the temple. He then proceeded to rape her before striking her repeatedly in the head and both temples. He then left her for, he left her for dead and she was found the following morning, dying in hospital the following day. Peter Curtin's final fatal attack occurred on November the 7th, 1929. This was five-year-old Gertrude Alberman persuading the young child to follow him along, follow him to an isolated area. He strangled the poor girl before stabbing her once in the temple with a pair of scissors. Don't just, just, pro, you know, I'm, I'm already, I'm going to hammer this into my kids so hard. Do not go the f- anywhere with strangers. And I've mentioned this before, but I heard the best thing to do, um, like, because we'll be at the park, right? And it was just me and my kids. And he'd be like, look, kids, we got to go home. No, no, I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. He's like, you're taking a screaming kid out of the park. Which uh, I think I told this story as well. A friend of mine had this and he was walking home from the shopping mall. And the police, like someone called the police on him because they were like, just in case. And the police showed up at his house. I can't remember how they found out where he lived or whatever. But they knock on the door and they're just like, yeah, just uh, make sure everything's okay. Because we heard um a man carrying a screaming kid home from somewhere or like from somewhere to somewhere else and we came to check in and my mate initially was like what the f- it's my daughter and then he immediately was like oh this is really good police work thank you so much because yeah 99 percent of the time or 99.999 whatever it's fine it's just a parent and their kids having a fit but one time it's not. But back to my original thing, the thing apparently to teach your kids is to tell them if it's not you to start screaming, you're not my mum, you're not my dad. And I'm apparently, and that's like, sends chill. it's like, that is f- creepy. And it's like, but apparently that's what you should teach the kids to say because that'll get people's attention rather than a screaming kid. Someone screaming, you're not my mum, <laughs> you're not my dad. is like way more intense. And you'll be like, uh, excuse me, are you, is this your mum? Is this, or more likely, is this your dad? <laughs> I just don't imagine. I know women also kidnap children, but it's mostly f- sick men, isn't it? Let's be honest, statistically. Be like, is that actually your dad? 
And if they answer no, just be like, okay, I'm going to need you to wait here, both of you. <laughs> Let me call the police just to make sure they're going to check your IDs. Uh, just to be safe. Just to be safe. <laughs> Holy <laughs> If you're ever unsure, intervene. Even though she was clearly dead at this point, he then proceeded to stab the body of the child a total of 34 times in the temple and chest before dumping her corpse in a nearby pile of nettles. All this carnage and bloodshed and misery, all of this occurred within a single year. So many dead. So many wounded and traumatized. All the while, the demon who caused all of it walked free and without a care. It makes me sick to my stomach that I wasn't able to find more information on the lives of those whose souls were stolen by this vicious maniac. Yes, some of them were far too young to have much information to start with, but even those on the older side have been simply relegate, relegated to names in a book, in a video, on a web page, or a police report. These were people. People like you and I with hopes and dreams, lives of our own. And, some, uh, and yet this is what they've been relegated to. I hate it, but this is the world we live in. The vampire ends all of their lives for his own grotesque satisfaction. But that would all soon come crashing down. A smile that Judas in hell might be proud of. Through the entirety of our journey, I'm sure there's been a question that's been buzzing around your heads. Where were the police? And the short answer is chasing their own damn tails. The public were in a panic as 1929 was coming to a close. So many girls had either been killed or almost killed that the police had no clue where to start. Really? Start anywhere, police. Just choose a random victim. And just be like, that's where we're going to start. Let's go from there. Surely that's not the actual issue. The biggest issue during most of the investigation is the simple fact that the authorities were strictly of the opinion that given all of the victims were of varying ages, it made all the sense in the world to them that it was the work of multiple murderers, not the handiwork of a single madman. Hell, Rudolf Scheer, Curtin's only male murder victim that year, wasn't even linked to him until he personally confessed to it. The police were going around in circles, the pressure of public outcry on their shoulders, all while Curtin wasn't even close to being on their suspect list. Ernst Gennert was the chief inspector of the Berlin police at the time of the Curtin murder spree. With a career spanning 30 years, he was one of the first to realize that it was crucial to preserve the crime scene as it was found in order to find proper evidence. I know that sounds laughable today, but this was the past. The Homicide Division thrived under his guidance, solving about 95% of cases that came their way. God damn, bravo! It was because of him, along with a rather arrogant mistake by the monster haunting their streets, that the police were put on the right track. Two days after his final murder, Curtin created and sent a map to a local communist newspaper revealing the location of the body of Maria Hahn. In his arrogance, he also felt the need to mark where he'd left the body of little Gertrude Alberman. Not only did this clearly link the murder of these two victims together, but it was because of this overconfident gloating that the police now had a sample of the killer's handwriting. After careful examination, it was clear as day that the creator of this map was also the author of the nameless letters they'd been receiving for months. Every letter Curtin had written and sent to the police and media were investigated further, all concluded to be written by the same hand. Again, it was over the moon, they finally had a break in the case. All these murders, no matter how improbable it seemed to the naked eye, were committed by the same monster. And just like that, the net had started to slowly close over the vampire, and it would be one final mistake that would end his reign of terror for good. The good god fashioned her for a purpose. 1930 came around, and several more attacks were reported to the police. Each was a woman, each was struck with a hammer, and their attacker attempted to strangle them before running off, leaving them bloody and gasping for breath. The police now had a more concrete description of the attacker, and the hunt continued in earnest. This now brings us to one Maria Budlick, a 20-year-old unemployed woman who resided in Dusseldorf at the time of the attacks. She was looking for employment, as well as a more stable place to live, when she was approached by a stranger while at Dusseldorf Station. Learning the pretty young lady was in search of a job and a place to lay her head, the stranger suggested that she follow him as he had the perfect place in mind. As the man began leading Maria toward a wooded area, she became apprehensive, and the two got into a bit of a tiff. That's when a new man came to the rescue of Maria, scaring the creep away. This wonderful saviour, of course, was our favourite life juice leech, Peter Curtin. Oh God, just as I thought it was the other way round. I thought that Peter Curtin was the woman, was the guy le leering her, luring her, and then this guy came in to save the day, and he'd be the guy who gets Curtin arrested, and hey, you know, everything's better now, but no. Just as Crown Count Dracula preyed on Mina Harker and Lucy Westenra, Curtin knew exactly what he wanted from Maria as soon as he laid eyes on her, originally inviting her to his residence at the Metmanner Strasse, to which she refused. 
He instead led her to Grafenberg Woods, where he raped the poor woman and tried to strangle her. This is where the vampire makes his one fatal mistake. He let her go. Yes, for some unfathomable reason, after Maria swore that she did not remember what Curtin's home address was, he released his grip and he let her leave, fortunately sparing her life. This is something that happens, this would never happen in a movie because it would be too unbelievable. It'd be like, no, I don't know. He wouldn't do that, but he did. And, uh, dude, (laughs) that is also insane. Now, Maria didn't go to the police right away, instead venting her fears and frustrations to a friend in a letter. Really? A clerk received the letter and seeing the postage was wrong, took it upon himself to open it, contacting the police shortly after reading it. What? Don't be doing that. I mean, I know this led to like him saving the day and all that. But if you've got a letter and it's wrong, just return it to sender or throw it away and the person won't get it. And that's fine. Don't be reading people's private letters. Isn't that illegal? That same letter made it all the way to Chief Inspector Gennat, who set to interview Maria immediately, suspecting the man who attacked her was the monster that he'd been hunting for the last year. Maria told him everything that happened, including the address of her assailant. Speaking with the landlady of the apartment, she confirmed the address, as well as his occupant, Peter Curtin. Realizing he'd been caught, Curtin fled. His identity was now known to the police. He knew he had been fingered as a suspect of the murders over the past year. He confessed to his wife about all of his rapes, and he went into hiding. When he finally returned home on the 23rd of May, he broke down and told her everything. Whether he saw the writing on the wall or not, he told her about all of his crimes, the murders included. He told her to turn him in and to claim the money on his head, perhaps the one true loving thing that he ever did for her. August did just that, spilling all she'd been told to the police, and that afternoon the vampire of Dusseldorf was finally arrested. Dude, I I don't understand. Like, you're a criminal who is committing horrible crimes, and you know at some point you're gonna get caught because you flee. How have you not got a better fleeing plan? (laughs) Like, if you're a criminal, have some ready to go. Have a plan of action to get out of town. Come on. (laughs) This basic crime here come on the year-long night of bloodshed and sorrow was finally over at least sunrise despair has its own calms while in custody peter Curtin admitted to every single atrocity that he had committed both to the crimes that the police had already suspected him of and to the ones they had no idea he had done 68 crimes in total including nine murders 31 attempted murders he told them everything He made no excuses for his crimes. He made it clear that he did everything for his own monstrous sexual gratification, and the sight of blood of his innocent victims stimulated him in ways that they couldn't possibly imagine. And even in the end, the sick bastard tried to show that he had some morals, making a point to the police that he never tortured any of the children whose lives had ended, that he made it as quick as possible, you f***ing psycho. By talking about how he apologized to many of his victims before their deaths, he recounted that he would tell them that that's what love is all about. He also made clear the fact that he did indeed drink the blood of several victims, each from different wounds. From the body of Han, he even claimed to have thrown up from the sheer amount of sanguine that he had consumed. A true monster in every sense. Funnily enough, I made a video about what happens when you drink blood. Um, It contains tons of iron, so it's really bad for you. It can, like, poison you. Don't do it. Important lesson. While awaiting trial, Curtin was approached and interviewed by one Dr. Carl Berg, a psychologist. He wanted to get a psychological profile of the vampire. He wanted to see uh, what made him tick. Curtin spoke about much, from uh, the changing of weapons, to his attempt to throw the police off to the number of stab wounds on each victim, signifying how long it would take him to reach a satisfying orgasm, even contradicting these claims by saying that it was all an attempt to strike back in an evil society that had warped and abandoned him. All right, mate, yeah, chill the f*** out. You're just a psycho. Let's not try and get too high, mighty about it. It's like, I'm fighting back against society. What, by murdering children? <laughs> idiot. At the end of the day, Dr. Berg and a multitude of other psychologists, perhaps the shock of many, declared that Peter Burr Curtin was in fact sane. Really? Sociopathic, yes. Psychotic, no question. Insane? Well, no. He had full control over every deplorable atrocity he committed against all of his victims. He enjoyed every step of it, and he appreciated the calculated criminality of everything he did. On April the 13th, 1931, the Dusseldorf, the vampire of Dusseldorf finally stood trial. He pled not guilty by reason of insanity, even after being given a clean bill of mental health by the doctors beforehand. Oh, and speaking on if he had any remorse for his victims, Curtin mints no words. I have no remorse. The prosecution was relentless in their case against Curtin. They brought in all the same doctors who talked on how this blood-sucking vermin was of sound mind when he did what he did. All the evidence pointed out how Peter stalked his victims. He followed them and was cold and calculated in his approach to cornering them. 
this way. The way he charmed several to follow him to the deserted areas where they would meet their sad ends. It was much like the hypnotic charm of a true-to-life vampire with the most grim results imaginable. Presiding judge Dr. Rose asked Curtin if he believed he had a conscience, and once again Curtin was quite clear. I have none. The punishments I have suffered have destroyed my feelings as a human being. That was why I had no pity for my victims. The Angel of Death will sound his trumpet for me. The trial of Peter Curtin lasted all of ten days. Despite his attempts to convince them of his madness, it's safe to say the jury didn't buy a lick of it. They did retire to deliberate, and they returned after only two hours, guilty on all charges, nine counts of murder, seven counts of attempted murder. The vampire was said to have no expression as the verdict was read, though he attempted to feign remorse in his final address to the court, despite all he had previously said. Yeah, sure, Peter, you actually felt bad, and I'm Bella Lugosi. Now, I know by now that Simon has probably been ranting and raving about how this wannabe Nosferatu deserved the death penalty. Um, yeah, yeah, for sure. But, well, I think you and everyone else will be happy to hear that's exactly what I get, what he got. But I'm curious about your reaction once I tell you exactly what happens. It wasn't a silver stake through the heart. It wasn't the first rays in the morning sun. It wasn't even being drowned in holy water. But it is a proven vampire killing method, so I'll take it. They're going to hang him, right? That's what they do. Or maybe chop his head off. 1930s? No, it's going to be hanging. In front of the whole court and every god who will listen, Dr. Do- uh, Judge Dr. Rose looked Peter Curtin directly in the eyes and sentenced him to death by beheading. Yes, the guillotine was still very much of in vogue back in 1930s Germany. Well, oh my. Curtin refused to appeal the verdict, though he did seek a pardon from the Minister of Justice. This was, of course, firmly denied. Upon hearing of the news, Curtin simply nodded, took it in his stride, and asked for one last request. He asked for a confessor to be brought to his cell. He had something for him to do. Upon the man arriving, Curtin sat back, calm as can be, and asked the man to pen letters of apology to the relatives of all of his victims. He also asked for one final letter to be written to his wife, a letter of love and a farewell. These requests were accepted and promptly carried out. Peter Curtin received his last meal on July the 1st, 1931. Venus schnitzel, a bottle of white wine and fried potatoes. After finishing, he asked for a second helping, which he received, being shown a touch more humanity in his final moments than he showed any of the poor souls he'd stolen away. Yeah, last meals. Getting to choose what you want and having wine? F*** that. You get the prison and then they kill you. Why? Why? I don't... Why Why did you do that? His execution was carried out at 6 o'clock the next morning in the grounds of Klingleput's prison. He walked up to the guillotine, a neutral look on his pale face, no muss, no fuss, flanked by a prison psychiatrist and a priest. Just as he was leaning down to get into position, the vampire couldn't help himself one final time. Turning to the psychiatrist with a sincerest look on his face, he asked one last question. Tell me, after my head is chopped off, will I still be able to hear for at least a moment the sound of my own blood gushing from the stump of my neck? That would be the pleasure to end all pleasures, dude. Upon receiving no answer, good. <laughs> He simply laid down on his back and waited for the moment to come. Looking up at the large blade glinting in the early morning sun, Peter Curtin couldn't help but smile. Drop, shink, thud, splash, thump. And just like that, the nightmare that had hung over all of Germany and her people had finally come to an end. Peter Curtin, the vampire of Dusseldorf, age 48, was dead. A wrap. And that's it. Dear audience, that's where our tale mercifully ends. I'd be lying to you all if I said it was easy. The depraved and disturbed acts orchestrated by Peter Curtin are some of the worst I've ever come across and will likely stick with me for some time. As the darkness of the shadows leaves us behind, we step out into a world of sunlight, a world where the vampire of Dusseldorf and the memory of his heinous crimes, I can say with earnestness, are simply not welcome. It's here that I need to once again send all my positive energy to the memories of the victims of this awful man. Christine Klein. Gertrude Franklin, Rosa Oliger, Rudolf Scheer, Maria Hahn, Louise Lenzen, Gertrude Harmacher, Ida Rauter, Elizabeth Dorier, Gertrude Alberman. Not to mention the two boys he killed as a child and every one of the men and women he attempted to kill, but he managed to survive. This man was a monster, and I can only hope that wherever all these people are after leaving this world, they're now at peace knowing he didn't get away with it. One final piece of information before we end today, and I believe it'll put a somewhat positive finish on this rather grim tale. Remember how the Beast of Sanets had his head preserved in a jar of chemicals, or perhaps how William Burke's skeleton is still on full display at the Edinburgh Medical School, along with a notebook bound in his tanned skin? Well, everyone, let's go on a journey. Close your eyes for me, and picture if you will. We arrive in Wisconsin Dells, Wisconsin, and we're standing in front of Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum. We pay our entrance fee and proceed to walk the halls through the rooms, examining all the exhibits and oddities that they have on display. Soon enough, we come upon a certain glass case, and we see something quite macabre and interesting, and upon reading the plaque, 
it all comes into focus. Behind the glass, and suspended by a chain rig, is the mummified head of a man, a look of momentary pain forever passed on his vile face. His head has been bisected right down the middle, his teeth flashing on both sides of the inside of his mouth. His the cavity where his brain once belonged, now long empty, his vacant eye sockets stare at us hauntingly, as if begging for the final release that he perhaps never truly got. This is the final fate of the Vampire of Dusseldorf, forever bound in brittle, paper-like skin for one and all to come and stare at. After his execution, his head was cut open, his brain removed in order to examine, to hopefully find what truly caused his mental state and the reason for his attacks and all those people. Sadly, to no avail. It was transported to the US and sold to the museum shortly after the end of World War II, where it remains on display to this very day. May his soul forever be in painful flux, forced to watch as hundreds of people come to stare and laugh at his hideous, immortalized head for all time. Rot in hell, Peter Curtin. Dismembered Appendices Number one, for all our wonderful Bookland listeners, you'll probably picked up on the fact that every chapter of the title of our script is a quota portion from Bran Stoker's Dracula. <laughs> yeah, I've never read it and I did not pick up on that, but I did think the titles were rather nice. Given the subject matter, I, fit I figured this would be fitting, given the monstrous actions of today's antagonist. I'll take any small pleasure I can get. Number two, a while it seems inconceivable that a horrible rampage like the one Curtin went on could be so quickly forgotten, the next few months after his death did just that. Soon after the vampire lost his head, Hitler completed his rise to power and everything that came after. Well, we know what happens. Guess it goes to show that the only thing that can overshadow a demented madman is even more demented madman. Number three, the interviews Curtin granted to Dr. Karl Berg in 1930 and 1931 proved to be the first ever psychological study conducted on a sexual serial killer. Truly influential and important stuff. Dubbing Curtin the king of the sexual perverts, Berg used these interviews to form the basis of his book, The Sadist. Number four, a stage play called Normal, the Dusseldorf Ripper, premiered in August 1991 at Edinburgh's Pleasance Theatre. As one could surmise, it focuses on the case surrounding Peter Curtin. There's even a movie from 2009 based on the play. Stay classy, humanity. <laughs> Indeed. Number five. Sadly, Peter Curtin wasn't the only monster loose in the world at the time of this rampage. Just as he was terrorizing the populace of Germany in the mid-1920s across the pond in America, the shadows of the states were haunted by the beast simply known as Albert Fish. The vampire and the werewolf reigned together. The past truly, undisputedly, was the worst. Yeah, have we done a video on Albert Fish yet? If not, it's coming up. And it's horrible. Anyway, this has been an episode of The Casual Criminalist. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching. Um, rough one today. Look, if you like this show, if you like what we do here, probably not, I say. <laughs> God. Please leave a review. That would be awesome um, on YouTube. Like, subscribe if you're watching there. And I'll see you next time.